We are in Liverpool in the Adelphi Hotel and it's uh, my great pleasure and privilege to be meeting and talking with Howard Soons who's just released or just had published a book called Fab and Intimate Life of Paul McCartney. Thanks for your time. Oh, it's nice to meet you. This is some book, some 620 odd pages full of Paul McCartney um, news in a, in a lot of senses of the word. Uh, I've, I've learned a lot in, in the sort of time that I've spent looking through it. And I was amazed how far went into, or towards the end, into the finances of the McCartney business empire. Where did all that come from? Well, it came from financial records, uh, business records, uh, legal papers. I, I've always done that as a writer. I've always got documents. I, so this isn't a book that's written from cuttings. Mm. It's a book that's done from original research. So apart from interviewing people, I was always amass documents. And I always personally find the financial dealings of great stars interesting. How much money they've got, how many houses they've got, how big, how big their land is. I mean, for instance, you'll find out in this book that Paul McCartney's farm in Sussex is a thousand acres, yeah. which is three times the size of Hyde Park. Yeah. It's twice the size of Central Park in New York. I mean, it's absolutely vast. That was one of the things that struck me, actually. I wanted to lead, lead with that, because a thousand acres is something like a thousand football pitches, isn't it? Something, something stupid like that. I'd, 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 well, it, I, it, I, I, worked, I, I thought, well, I was walking around Hyde Park in London one day, which is a pretty big park. You know, it's a good old bit of exercise to walk around Hyde Park on Sunday. And I worked out it was three times the size of Hyde Park. So yeah. that's, and, it's, and it's not in back of beyond. It's in a very nice part of Sussex. It's a very expensive area. Yeah, and that's just one place that he's got a and few... Yeah. There's a thousand acres in Scotland, there's a thousand acres in Arizona. I worked out there's 13 homes, 13 principal homes. Incredible. Well, let's go right back to the beginning. Um, there must have been a, a specific reason for you writing this book. Did, was it that you wanted to publish some information that you'd come across that you thought was perhaps um, exclusive? No, not really. I mean, I'm a professional author. I write non-fiction for a living. I write biography. And essentially, every three years, I write a new book. And as a writer, I, th I think to myself, what is a good subject? And for a good subject, you need a good story. You need a subject that's international, hopefully, if you're going to be published in the States. Um, and the Beatles is, of course, the biggest band in the history of rock and roll, without, you know, full stop. And Paul McCartney is probably the premier living rock star in the world. Um, it's a British story, and I'm a British writer, so I feel an affinity for it. Um, and it's an international story. Uh, it's a story in two halves. You know, the Beatles story is very well known. I mean, writing this book is a bit like writing The Life of Winston Churchill. You've got to tell the story of the Second World War, which is very well known, but then there's what happens after the Second World War, which is also actually rather fascinating. Um, and I think the story of Paul's life has recently got much more interesting because of the very sad death of Linda, which is a very poignant part of the book, and his, frankly, calamitous second marriage, which gives the book a very interesting ending. And a great deal of information has come out because of that divorce. Well, one of the interesting pieces of information that I picked up on when I was uh, what I call power reading <laughs> um, was uh, one of his scurrilous relatives <laughs> who <laughs> absconded with quite a bit of money from a boat. Where did that come from? Well, that's a completely brand new story. There's many brand new stories in Fab, and one of them is the story never before told of uh, Paul's nefarious uncle Will, who did time for larcenary on the high seas. He stole some money. From, he, was a, he was a seaman. Uh, where did it come from? It came from a, re a, a relative of Paul telling me the story in conversation, uh, anecdotally, uh, and then I went away and I found the, the evidence, because I found actually it was a big story at the time. It was in the Times. It was in the front page of the, of the papers here in Liverpool. But no one in all these years had picked up on that. Amazingly, it had been, it's in fact a 60 year family secret. Yeah. Well, there was a, as I remember when I, um, when I interviewed Philip Norman, there was a, a Mimi family secret that came out as well. So they are still there, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, they are. I mean, you have to dig. But I mean, the thing is, of course, as one is sort of uh, trained, as it were, to dig in, to, dig, to find the loose threads of people's lives and pull at them until you get a story. Yeah. And that's exactly what that is. Yeah, it was fascinating. And do you, when it comes to something like that, do you have any. Do, because I'm not an author, but I, I, I wonder if I'd have found that and I was writing, but whether or not it, I thought it might have been a, a good idea or a bad idea, and maybe um, you might not have got some attention um, that you wouldn't have, have, have liked so much from, from the McCartney estate. Did that no. ever cross your mind? No, no. I mean, I don't have any feelings like that. I mean, 
one's, one's duty is to tell a good story as well as you can and tell it truthfully. As long as it's truthful and it's well told, I'm absolutely happy about um, yeah, everything should go in, as long as it's true. Yeah. Um, and, um, and I was very excited when I found that story. And in fact, I'm rather amazed that you're the first person that actually seems to have noticed it because it's actually a fantastic story. Well, it is. But I was very lucky, of course, to get a, an early copy of the book. Well, the Daily Mail serialised this book at great expense over three days. And the most, you know, the, one of the greatest editors in Fleet Street today, Paul Dacre, the Daily Mail, he didn't seem to see it. But it's, it's actually a fantastic story. Well, it is. It is. And as a, a Beatle fan like myself, we love things like this. Yeah. But because what it actually proves is they are not demigods <laughs> well it proves that actually one of Paul's rallies was a scally as they say locally you know I mean Paul is actually himself I'm the first to say a rather upstanding guy you know he's a you know he's conducted himself very well apart from getting busted for drugs repeatedly and this terrible second marriage and he comes from a fairly upstanding Liverpool working class working class but, but straightforward honest family but there is this black sheep rather like um, uh, John's ne'er-do-well dad freddy he was of course a crook a uh, bit of a crook bit of a, a lad there was uncle will who was really the same sort of guy and also another seaman another seaman mm. yeah um some of the other things i picked up on was um uh one of his old friends um one of the other things i picked up was one of his old friends tony saying that when paul likes you you get all the thumbs up and then you got the prodding finger paul <laughs> i thought that was fantastic yeah that's a good line that's funny isn't it um tony bramwell tells that story uh, and um he must have told that before but i've never read it anywhere else but apparently of course we all know about paul with his thumbs up but as tony points out when he's not in a very good mood you, he prods you in the chest while he tells you off and of course he does he has this what well, i think as you read the book you will, you will see that in fact he can be a rather difficult man and very demanding and if you let him down if you work for him if you're in a record company or in his office or something if you're not doing a good job you know you'll soon know about it yeah well um we certainly know someone who was with him for 15 years that had a big fallout as well and that leads us on to the the heather part of the book which um you've spent quite a bit of time talking about and then you must have done an awful lot of research into that as well yeah yeah it's just a great story i mean how is it possible that this man so clever so worldly so experienced fell for a topless former topless model with um who'd uh, a self-confessed shoplifter from a council estate in, in Gateshead or Tyne and Weir, I mean, uh, with a very murky past, how on earth did he fall for this woman? Everybody around him said she was bad news, and yet he, um, yet he marries her and uh, loses a, you know, a huge chunk of his fortune. Yeah, and if we get back to that uh, again, how um, he's got all these 12 or 13 homes and thousands of acres, and how I, I noticed that, um, again, something that I didn't know. Uh, when they were in Scotland, he noticed some girls in a wood who were camping there, yeah. looking at him. He didn't like it. And then he was accused of assault, which um, you get this sort of thing all the time. And um, I imagine that you have to be a bit careful with things like that as well. But he actually bought the wood to stop anybody else going yeah, there. That's a new story. And I got that story by going up to Kintyre and spending a week there talking to his neighbours, who amazingly had never been interviewed before, all the local farmers. And they all know him really well. They're mates. And, they, and, they, and their kids grew up with his kids. And so, you know, Heather would go riding her pony with the, with, uh, the girl from the neighbouring farm. You know, that's how close they were. And for years, he went there every summer for at least two weeks. So they knew him really well. And that's a great story that he had, he had a crazy fan, a Mormon from Utah, a girl, who basically camped on the edge of his, of his estate in Scotland and watched him through binoculars in his little cottage with Linda and the kids. This is back in the early 70s. He couldn't get rid of her because she wasn't actually on his land. She was in, uh, it was a sort of, it was forestry commission land she was on, in the trees. They finally had a confrontation where she accused him of assault. He denied it, came to nothing. He solved the problem, I'm told, by one of the farmer neighbours by simply buying the wood. And in fact, today, he owns, again, a thousand acres. And in fact, you can't even see his house unless you go on his land. Although, curiously, in Scotland... There isn't, there, there isn't this trespass problem. In fact, you, there is a right to roam. So, in fact, you can walk straight past his front door, if you like, quite legally now. But years ago, that wasn't the case. Mm. 
Oh, I didn't know that. Um, how long did it take you to do this? Because you, you've obviously spent a lot of time, these 600 and odd pages, yeah. and all these new stories, and travelling here and there. It must have, must have been a large part of your life. Well, about two and a half years. About two and a half years. So there's a good year and a half of solid research, and then I start writing. It took me exactly one year to write it, 12 months. But during that year, one also did more research. and you know, So two and a half years in total. I, I guess really, you know, Books about the Beatles will never stop because there must be somebody out there who's always going to stumble across something that they can work into the works that everybody else has done. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I mean, there's all, mind you, having said that, most of the books are bad. I mean, uh, now, I would say this, wouldn't I? But most of the biographies of Paul McCartney are rubbish. The only one I would say of any real quality before mine was Barry Miles, Many Years From Now, which is a great book. I'm the first to say it's a fabulous book. But it's got a few problems. One is that basically Sir Paul was in charge of it, and so he vetted it. He, some things he didn't want to be in the book. And, of course, it's really a book about the 60s. You know, it's not a book about now. And um, I would hope that Fab is the best book about Paul since many years from now. Um, it's not done with his, with his cooperation, but it is done with a sort of rigorous... It's rigorously researched. There is lots of new stuff in it. And, and most importantly of all, I hope, it's entertaining. I, it's a good read. You want to know what happens next, like a good novel. The one thing I was looking for that I, I couldn't find, and I don't know whether it's in there, as I said, because I sort of speed read it, was um, the Mel of Kintyre copyright, copyright with Danny Lane. And as, as, as far as I'm aware... Uh, Paul bought Denny Lane's share of the copyright from him when, when Denny once again went broke. Well, that's true. Uh, I mean, that's not in the book because there's just not room for everything. I mean, that's certainly true. I was more interested, really, in pointing out that I think the lyric of Mull of Kintyre is one of his better lyrics. And I think, uh, as I develop the story, my argument in the book, one of his weaknesses as a, as a, as a star has been his lyric writing, which has often been poor, but Mull of Kintyre is a very good lyric. It's like a lyric poem. And, of course, uh, it turns out that the reason for that is he didn't actually write it, or at least he didn't write all of it. Denny co-wrote it. And so one of his best lyrics is not by him, as it were, which I think is more interesting than the fact that Denny, of course, has had well-known financial problems, and, indeed, he sold the song to Paul. Um, but that's really Denny's story more than Paul's story. Yeah. OK, well, it's... Uh, let me recommend it to everybody, 600 and, I think it's 622 pages or thereabouts, and within a f the first few minutes I was starting to learn things about Paul that I didn't know before. And uh, Howard, it's been wonderful, and, and thanks to Rachel and everybody for sending me a copy of the book to, to read. Have you got some Paul McCartney or Beatles songs I can play for you? Well, um, I like uh, Let Me Roll It, I like Maybe I'm Amazed, and I like that, that, was, that was me from the last album, you know, when he looks back over his life. Okay, well, we'll play those for you, and Howard, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Nice to meet you.